The search for extraterrestrial intelligence using radio signals is almost as old as radio technology itself. More than a hundred years ago, Nikola Tesla thought he might be receiving radio signals from Mars. Today, SETI work is carried out by scientists around the world who tirelessly search the skies for all kinds of possible messages from alien planets. Michael Garrett is a professor at the University of Manchester and also co-vice chair of the SETI Permanent Committee at the International Academy of Astronautics. Part of his work is creating a set of instructions for how Earth should react if we were to detect an alien signal. What are some of the protocols that you and your colleagues have been working on that you think are really important for that moment should it happen? So uh, one of the things that the CETI-PC has worked on for many decades, in fact, is to try and make sure that um, if people do sort of detect a signal, that they, they follow certain rules so that we can be sure that, you know, it really is a signal, that this really is sort of definitive um, evidence of, you know, extraterrestrials before that would go public. Um, obviously, you only want to go public with, with something which is really big news. You only really want to do that when you're absolutely sure that this really is a detection and that it isn't some, you know, interference, uh, you know, in, you know, or just over the hill, as it were, from your radio telescope. So there's a set of protocols that have been sort of agreed by most of the organisations that are sort of involved in SETI that, you know, we should try and follow the rules um, to make sure that when we do come out with an announcement that we've made a detection that we are sort of 99.999% um, sure that it really is something. I kind of wanted to just share a, a story from when I logged in from to Twitter today, which normally I would not um, subject a person to, but I thought it was an interesting example of these issues because someone had asked on Twitter, uh, if aliens attacked us, what newscaster would you be watching for the updates? And there were, you know, a bunch of pundits were trending because of this. Um, I'm not sure it's the greatest idea to be sat in front of a TV if aliens attack us. But <laughs> in any case, I thought it was an interesting example of the kind of challenges of a fractured news environment, especially on a topic like this, because you know, how are you going to control the dissemination of good information when you have it? sort of being all siloed away into different news sources. So how does your committee kind of approach the problem of um, making sure that like, if there was an un unambiguous detection of, of intelligent life, it wouldn't sort of just spread misinformation across all of these different news sources? I mean, I think that's that's a really good uh, example of a problem that I think that that we have. So if you look at the SETI protocols, for example, um, and you look at the documents that have been written, they've been written a long time ago and they've been written long before sort of social media was as, as prevalent. I personally believe that there's a good chance that SETI will, you know, a, a signal, a very interesting signal might be discovered just by sort of any astronomer who just might be going about their business and doing mm -hmm. any kind of routine observation. They probably have never heard of the SETI protocol, for example. Um, and so I think it will actually be, it's possible that it could be really difficult to um, manage the whole sort of, you know, how the news of, of such a sort of really important discovery, how that would propagate. If you look at a lot of recent activity in SETI or even in, for example, the discovery of gravitational waves, mm -hmm. then you see that these things typically leak. And the more people that are involved, for example, in the follow-up and the confirmation of a SETI signal, the, the more likely it is to leak. So I, I think trying to control sort of how this um, sort of comes out on social media and in the news in general will be, will be very difficult. But the important thing is that you, you write a good scientific paper that um, a large group of people, not just one group, but, but several groups can stand behind. I think most people's uh, conception of what a first contact moment would be like is very informed by the many science fiction uh, ideas about this. And there's so many different visions of that. So uh, what about the kind of perhaps more unlikely um, 
scenario where an alien ship kind of just pops up in our orbit, you know, mm -hmm. or we have the Independence Day giant saucers going over cities and things like that. Is there a different protocol than just getting information from a very distant civilization uh, in the case of actually having the species be right there? Yeah, I think I think if every, everyone could see them and they're on CNN or the BBC <laughs> or something like that, then yeah, the protocols go out the window. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it, it sounds crazy, but you know, we absolutely have no idea what, what what's out there. We have no idea how we're going to discover the the first SETI signal. I would say that, you know, if you look at science, science is always surprising. You know, it's always surprising us in some way, and discoveries typically happen. In, in ways that we we really didn't predict, you know, and I would be I would be really surprised if SETI was discovered, you know, just you know by SETI scientists going out on their radio telescope and, and getting that signal. I think it'll be something completely unexpected, something mm -hmm. that surprises in many different ways, and something that we're probably not prepared for. Um, you know, we don't know everything. You know, we hardly know anything. Um, about physics and astronomy, if you consider the fact that we don't know what dark matter is, although we've, we've known it's been around for, you know, almost 100 years now. We don't know anything about dark energy, which has been around for 20 years. That encompasses most of the ener energy budget of the universe. There's a hell of a lot of things that we don't understand um, mm -hmm. about our own galaxy and all the other galaxies that are out there. Uh, and, and probably extraterrestrial intelligence falls into the same sort of um, area. We've been looking for it for a long time. We think we know what we, you know, what we, we know what we look like, but we actually don't know what they look like in, in terms of the signature of, you know, extraterrestrial intelligence. So we need to be prepared for completely the unexpected. And, and the thing I, li I like about this is that um, everyone can have a valid opinion about what to expect. Everyone, you know, because we absolutely have no idea what it is that we should be looking for. We have some ideas what we think we should be looking for, but the reality might be something different. And so that's one of the great things about SETI is that I think to, to detect extraterrestrial intelligence, you need to think as broadly as possible. And so everyone's opinion counts. There's, there's no right answer to, to this question at the moment. Everyone can make a contribution. Yeah, that's really wonderful. And you, you, when you even think about the different ways that animals on Earth communicate or life forms on Earth communicate, there are definitely some examples of very alien-ish, alien-adjacent <laughs> communication techniques just here on our own planet. So yeah. I cannot, yeah, it, it, you literally cannot imagine um, what is out there. So to think that there's only one type of intelligence and it's biological um, and it looks like us and it thinks like us, and, and not to think that there might also be other possibilities out there, I think is wrong. And I think that's why you just need to be as, as sort of broad thinking as possible. I'm not going to say that I think all my colleagues in SETI think this way, but I, I, I personally feel that you need to think of all sort of possible um, possibilities. And, you know, something landing on the, the lawn of the White House might be quite extreme, but no one can rule it out. So in the popular science version that you see, in contact or arrival is another one. Uh, you get a contact with an alien species and it immediately gets locked down by the military and there's no information coming out. Um, is that something that you could ever see happening? I don't really think so. I don't, I think that, you know, sort of outside of the science community, um, other communities are only going to get interested in this when um, it's clear that this is a real signal, you know, and, 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 and by that time there will be so many people that know in so many different countries that I think it's un unrealistic to sort of somehow lock down a facility or lock down information. Say we get a fairly unambiguous signal. Maybe we don't know how to decode it because it's very alien, but we can tell that it's not natural. What are your thoughts on communicating back? Because there's been some debate on this. Stephen Hawking had said that at some point that he thought that was a bad idea to be messaging aliens because what if they're hostile? Do you think that there are those kinds of ethical concerns that should go into planning to 
send a signal back uh, to a species that has sent a signal to us. I think it's fair to say that the, the sort of community is quite polarized on this. So there's, hmm. there's a lot of people who are dead against sending out those messages. And Stephen Hawking was probably the most famous scientist who was really against the idea. Um, but then on the other side, you have many people who think, you know, if we don't communicate, if we don't send those signals out there, then why should we ever expect to sort of find signals ourselves when we're, when, when we're doing SETI? I kind of sit actually on the fence a little bit on, on this one. I kind of see both, both sides of the, the story. And it would be really difficult to stop individuals from sending such signals. You know, there's a lot of groups that are in control of um, pretty big uh, antennas that could transmit a signal if they if they if they wanted to. So again, it's a bit like um, the internet and social media. It's actually quite hard to control a response from Earth um, because you know some people have the capability to send whatever they want to um, to a particular star. It might take a long while to get there. Maybe it takes a hundred years, so it might not affect us at the moment. But it might have consequences for our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So potentially a species could be getting a lot of scattered answers from different organizations uh, if, if they contacted us. Probably. Probably would do, yeah. I'm almost, almost sure that would be the case. <laughs> that's, very, that's a very human response. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I sometimes worry if I took a bad tone in an email I sent, I can't imagine how bad it would be if you're not sure you took the right, if you're miscommunicating somehow in the content of a message to an alien species. I mean, to be honest, it would be really quite interesting because it would be a sort of competition. You know, as soon as one yeah. country starts transmitting, then surely another country is going to transmit and they will be trying to present the best, their best sort of sides, as it were. Um, so, yeah, it would, um, I think it might become a bit of a free-for-all eventually. <laughs> it's so funny because often the uh, the alien trope in movies is that the world comes together to face the aliens, and I, I know that's usually a hostile <laughs> alien thing, but it is very funny to think of us all competing against yeah. each other, being like, no, talk to me, talk to our yeah. country. <laughs>